Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Rapid Development of Multiplex Serological Assays for COVID-19 Beyond. This webinar is part of the ongoing coronavirus virtual webinar series. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Luminex. For more information about Luminex, go to www. LuminexCorp.com. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you'd like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, Click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Without further ado, I now present today's speakers. Dr. Steve Angeloni, Senior Field Application Scientist at Luminex, and Dr. Nicole Pecora, an assistant professor in pathology and laboratory medicine at the University of Rochester Medical Center. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Mr. Angeloni, Dr. Angeloni, and Dr. Picora, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome, both of you. Yes, thank you for that introduction and welcome to our presentation. As you all know, the world was turned upside down at the beginning of 2020. And it all began with an outbreak in Wuhan, China, that was detected by Chinese health officials there in December of 2019, where they're observing an increased number of severe pneumonia-like cases. Shortly after that, in early January, scientists confirmed that this was due to a novel coronavirus. And in early January, the Chinese released the sequence of that virus to the world. As January progressed, cases in the, in the U.S. started to pop up. And in Wuhan, China, the epidemic got so severe that Wuhan had to be closed down and people were ordered to stay at home. It started to spread into Europe, where the WHO decided uh, that it was going to be a global health uh, emergency. Then in February, one of the first molecular diagnostic assays in the U.S. were released by the CDC. While it got off to a bumpy start, it became one of the front runners in determining whether people had coronavirus. In early March, the WHO declared this as a global pandemic. And then later in March, the U.S. declared a national emergency with stay-at-home orders and shutting down of many businesses. By the beginning of April, it became apparent that serological assays were also going to be important. And one of the first cleared serological assays was a lateral flow technology by Celex that measured IgM and IgG titers. After that, a number of serological assays were also developed and approved for uh, screening for coronavirus antibodies, and we'll look at that later. In addition, as the month of June progressed, um, there's more, actually more than 7 million or up to 8 million cases now that have been confirmed globally. And the death toll is climbing well above 400,000 and climbs every day and every week. So what are coronaviruses? Well, coronaviruses are a branch of the ribovirus lineage with COVID-19 being a new SARS variant. Like the other SARS variants, it has a genome that's a plus RNA strand genome of about 30,000 nucleotides. Transmission is spread mainly by aerosols, which enter through the lungs. And like SARS virus and a number of other respiratory virus, it exhibits zoonotic transmission, allowing it to be transmitted between different animal species. So technologies for uh, studying the virus and looking at it spread through the population include uh, looking for the viral RNA by molecular methods. Then there are some proteomic applications. Some can look for the presence of viral antigens but it's become incre increasingly important to look for the antibodies against viral antigens. So let's look at some of the technology used to do these types of measurements. We're looking for viral RNA. RT-PCR chemistries are the best way to go. The CDC's uh, RT-PCR test kit is one example. A number of other companies have developed quicker assays for individual analysis, such as the isothermal assay from Abbott, and a number of other isothermal assays have been uh, developed and approved, one by Rutgers University. The Rutgers University Institute for Health actually has a nice list of other molecular assays that can be used for detecting the viral RNA presence in samples. 
Luminex also has a couple of platforms for looking for viral RNA. The next tag chemistry can look for MERS, the SARS-CoV-2, as well as the SARS from the 2019 uh, epidemic. They also have an ARIES platform that has a simple sample to answer chemistry for looking at SARS-CoV-2. For detection of viral antigens, sandwich capture assays are the best way to do that. While these can be used in situations where the viral genome is probably not going to be picked up by uh, PCR methods, this kind of chemistry can be used to try to detect viral antigens in the food supply, in the mail on various shipping containers, as well as in a variety of biofluids and tissues. It can also be used to monitor domestic wild uh, stock, livestock, and other animals that might be imported or exported. However, it's also useful for looking for serum markers because one complication of infections is a cytokine storm. This is a severe inflammatory response, not only to coronavirus, but other pathogens that can complicate the recovery of patients. So being able to track and manage the clinical progress of, of treatments with patients undergoing cytokine stor storm would be a significant advantage in the clinic. There's actually a Luminex assay that can do this. It's a BioRad 27-plex cytokine assay on a BioPlex 200 instrument. It was actually used already in China to monitor the, the uh, management of cytokine storm in COVID-19 patients, as this 2020 paper uh, describes. What's become increasingly important is the need for detecting antibodies against the different viral antigens. These can be used for a variety of post-pandemic immunosurveillance applications, because if, as expected, antibodies generated against the virus can provide protection, then we want to be able to screen individuals that have been uh, infected and have survived so that we can probably give them clearance to return to work uh, without the concern of them spreading the virus or being susceptible to, to the virus. This would allow us to do immunosurveillance of various populations in the healthcare industry, the military, and other essential workers that can return to work. As a diagnostic alternative to looking at uh, you know, the presence of the virus, in cases where the virus might no longer be present, it can also give us the ability to look at high-resolution analysis of the titers of different Ig isoforms during or after an infection. It can also help us monitor the variants that are circulating through different populations. And in immunocompromised patient populations, it could also help us monitor their ability to develop a defense to the disease by generating antibodies or not. In the research front, it can be used for a number of applications to study the epidemiology, clinical applications, and ways to monitor the prevalence of the, the, um, the antigens and the development of antibodies in populations as a resource management. As far as developing uh, treatments such as vaccines, the development of biologicals, and in clinical trials, the assays can also be used to look at the human immunogenicity and efficiency of the various vaccines. For convalescent plasma and immune biologicals, it could also be used to test those uh, compounds as well as monitor the quality of their manufacturing. And then in, in subject trials, it can be used to qualify subjects with regards to existing titers as well as qualify how well the uh, treatments are working. So a number of serological assays have already been approved by the FDA. A number of them look at only the spike protein, but can look at either IgG, and some can look at IgG and IgM. A number of applications have been developed that look at only nucleocapsid antibody responses, and these can also look at either IgG or IgG and IgM. One of these applications has been developed on the Luminex platform. Currently, there is uh, one, pro one assay that's been developed that can look at spike and nucleocapsid antibody production. And that's on the CELLX lateral flow technology that can look at both IgG and IgM. So Luminex is actually poised to be able to take these, tech, these approaches and do them in a multiplex fashion, not only for a variety of proteome applications, but for genomic applications as well. And this can be done by the fact that we have the ability to multiplex on the Luminex platform. This is achieved by having sets dyed of different colors so that each color bead set can be assigned a different analyte. So for example, this would be the, an example of a 100-plex assay with these four particular bead regions being specific for these analytes. For coronavirus, this could be a nucleocapsid, spike protein, a receptor binding domain, and maybe some other variant in that mix. 
And if you wanted to, you didn't have to run all 100 different bead regions for 100 different analytes. You could run just these four if you wanted to. By doing this, we have the ability to mix up to 100, 500 different bead regions in one reaction, allowing you to mix up to one, look at, look at 100 anal, 500 analytes or more in one reaction. And this can be done in either a 96 well plate or depending on which instrument you have, a 3D4 well plate. So the power of this multiplexing ability has uh, several features. First, compared to single plex reactions, you can use less sample and less reagents. You require less time and labor to process the assays. It's gonna be less expensive. You get more data faster. It's also more flexible because you can easily add or take out bead regions for different analytes at will. It gives better reproduci reproducibility as well as enhanced statistical power. Compared to planar spotted arrays, the bead stay in suspension, which gives you fast fluid kinetics in suspension that helps you measure the analytes more accurately as opposed to uh, spots on the bottom of a well that can interact with uh, analytes that have to be mixed thoroughly and maybe have cross uh, fluorescence that can, uh, this, that can cause uh, blending out or bleeding out into other bead regions or spot regions on a spotted array. So a good example of the power of this multiplexing ability is an example of a 107 plex assay we ran for one client where we had 14 samples that we ran in triplicate. With the Luminex platform, we could run this in 42 wells of a 96 well plate, where if we tried to do this with a standard single plex chemistry, it would have required almost 4,500 wells, which is equivalent to about 47 96 well plates. So this approach has already been used to study coronavirus titers. For example, in this paper from 2019, this group looked at the antibody titers against nucleocapsid protein from six coronavirus variants. They ran almost 600 samples. And in doing this study, they were able to see at least 80% correlation with regards to picking up positive titers for the specific uh, nucleocapsid samples had in them. And on the negative samples, we had also about 80% or higher correlation with regards to correctly identifying negative samples. So if this particular assay was put into the clinical field, and you say you wanted to look at 1,000 samples with this six-plex coronavirus assay, <clears throat> on Luminex, this would have required about 1,000 wells, which is equivalent to about 10 96-well plates. If you did this with a standard single-plex chemistry, this would have required almost 6,000 wells, or about 62 96-well plates. If this was going to be done also, say, with a, a, a lateral flow type technology, it would have required 6,000 lateral flow cartridges, as opposed to still being able to do it on only 10 96-well plates with the Luminex platform. So let's look at how to build an indirect serological assay on the Luminex platform. So you have two options. One of the first options is a standard option of being able to couple your proteins directly by the fact that our Luminex beads have carboxyl groups on them, which when activated with EDC, will react with amines on your proteins. This can be done pretty simply and doesn't take that much time, only a few hours. The first step is activation of the carboxyl groups with EDC and stabilizing it with sulfur NHS, which takes about 20 minutes, followed by an incubation of your protein with the activated beads. This can take anywhere from an hour to several hours, where your protein will then be covalently coupled to the bead. So coupling large proteins such as the spike protein is fairly simple. The spike protein has a lot of lysine residues which provide those free amines for linking to the activated carboxyl groups. Coupling smaller domains or smaller antigens is also fairly easy because of the large number of lysine residues that proteins will have in them. Coupling of peptides, however, can be trickier. Some peptides may have no lysines or few lysines. As in the example of this particular peptide, which does have three lysines in it, the way it folds, the presence of these lysines may be in pockets, which cause the protein to be coupled in an orientation, which will not let you detect antibodies term, you know, being reactive to specific epitopes on this particular peptide. In scenarios like this, where the carboline diamond carbodiamide coupling is not going to be feasible, we have another option, which is you can biotinylate either the N-terminus or the Kabachi terminus of your peptide, and then use some beads that we sell that have avidin coated on them, then select for each peptide a particular bead region you want that peptide bound to, 
and you can incubate that peptide for about 30 minutes with its specific bead region, do several washes, and within under an hour, you now have peptides that are gonna be tightly coupled to your avidin bead. Since the KD for this biotin avidin association is 10 to the minus 15 molar, this is almost as good as a covalent coupling and can be done rapidly and allow you to develop assays fairly quickly. So here's a bunch of tips that you will need to use when developing your assay. First of all, while the genome for the coronavirus encodes a number of enzymes and non-structural proteins, the proteins usually used in these antibody titer assays include the spike, the nucleocapsid, and a number of people are starting to use the spike receptor binding domain. When selecting these uh, antigens, keep in mind that you can couple either the whole proteins, you can use specific domains, or you can use peptides that are representative of specific epitopes that you're interested in. In some scenarios, you can use virus-like particles as well, but the virus-like particle beads are usually not as stable as coupling these other forms of the proteins to the beads. And so these other forms of proteins are better to use for assays that you need to be stable to use over a longer period of time. So when selecting your antigens, you should also know your antigen well. When purchasing antigens from uh, standard off-the-shelf suppliers, you want to verify the protein sequence. That's the one you need. Because there can be variants out there, and some proteins, while well-conserved, some have divergent sequences that will not uh, be suitable for the performance of the assay. So knowing what se sequence you are getting can be important for developing a reliable assay. When using whole proteins or domains, that are expressed in different expression systems, the expression system you select is also important. Because you want to make sure that, number one, that the expression system can generate a sufficient amount of proteins, hopefully at an affordable cost, in addition to that the antigens are folded properly, and if any specific post-translational modifications are necessary, that they're properly modified as needed for performance in the assay. So the other thing is that when proteins are generated in these different expression systems, they will have different tag sequences that will be used for purification. Some of the properties of these tag sequences are important because you don't want tag sequences that can react to antibodies in the serum sample or react with the detection chemistries that you're using. So this includes things like various FC domains that are used uh, and various other domains that come off of other viruses that could interact with uh, your serum sample or some of your detection reagents. So when choosing these antigens, if off-the-shelf ones are not suitable for your application, there are vendors that will make custom proteins for you. So this can usually be a little more expensive and takes a little longer time, but if you need a very specific sequence that's not available, it is an option. Also, when de determining detection reagents to use, there are a number of antibody sources out there, and sometimes it can be difficult to, to pan those sources and determine which ones you need to try. Generally, if some are not defined in the literature as being very good universally, you'll need to try some from a variety of sources. And there's a variety of online tools that will help you find various antibody vendors, as well as protein sources if you need control proteins. And this white paper about needing antibodies for your Luminex assay is available for you to look at these sources. So once you've got all these reagents in hand, building an assay requires three steps. The first is coupling your antigens or binding your antigens to avidin beads. The second is confirming antigen coupling. This will require antibodies that are specific for each antigen. These can be monoclonal or polyclonal, and they can be unlabeled. And if they're unlabeled, of course, you'll need a second detection antibody that can be either biotin labeled and then using SAPE, or it can be PE labeled. In some situations, if you don't have a monoclonal or polyclonal that's available, you can use strong positive serum samples to determine if antibody coupling is present. When doing that, you wanna test that with a strong positive serum and define negative serums just to make sure you're actually seeing specific signal. Once confirmation has been confirmed, the next step is assay optimization. This requires testing a combination of sample dilutions, amount of detection reagents, incubation times and conditions to determine the optimum conditions needed to ensure accurate sensitivity and accuracy of the assay. When doing these confirmations or running the assay itself, it's a pretty simple process. It's a matter of taking either individual beads with their own antigens or beads, different beads with different antigens and running them in a multiplex mix. In this case, this would be equivalent to a two-plex assay. 
where you then take your bead mix, you mix it with the sample containing antibodies. Those antibodies, if specific for the antigen, will bind to that bead. And then you come in with your antibody detection uh, reagent, which in this case is, say, an anti-IgG that's biotin labeled. That will then bind to the uh, other beads. And if you want to, you can pick IgGs that are specific for either Ig subtypes or the IgG that you're interested in. And then this will bind to the antibodies. You can come in with SAPE for this one. And then in each well of a 96 well plate, this can then be read in one of our Luminex instruments, where each well is going to be a single sample measuring multiple antibody titers, depending on how many different beads you have in there with the different antigens, with up to 500 maximum. Now, if you wanted to look at different Ig subtypes in this type of assay, then each sample would require additional wells with the detection reagent specific for that Ig class you wanted to measure. Processing of the assay can take anywhere from just a few hours to several hours, depending on the sensitivity and how the assay was designed. And it generally will en encapsulate taking your beads, mixing it with sample for a specified period of time, doing several washes, adding the detection reagent, several more washes, and then reading one of our instruments. So this type of approach has already been used with the Luminex platform for a number of different pathogens not just the coronavirus that we looked at earlier. It's also been used in a variety of animal model systems to look at the presence of titers against various animal, uh, animal viruses and other pathogens in bovine, livestock, and, and various companion animals. It's also been used in vaccine testing, as is exemplified by this uh, measles, mumps, rubella, varicella assay uh, st study here. And it's also been used in, uh, as immunosurveillance, in this case, studying of uh, population exposed to different malaria parasites. So corona antibody titers have also been developed by a number of uh, partners that we work with, both academic as well as uh, corporate and some state laboratories, one of which is the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York, their central laboratory. And Dr. Picora has data on that. So Dr. Picora, I'll turn that over to you. Hi, thanks, Steve. Yeah, so I'm going to jump in for a few slides and talk about the uh, COVID-19 serological assay that we have developed here um, in our clinical diagnostic laboratory um, on the Luminex platform. So this assay is a five-plex assay. Um, of the five bead regions, three of them are coronavirus-specific. So we um, purchased all of our antigens from a commercial supplier. Um, in this case, it was GenScript. Uh, the three coronavirus antigens we used were the full spike protein that was expressed in insect cells. Uh, we also used the RBD by itself, the receptor binding domain, as well as the nucleocapsid protein um, expressed in E. coli. The RBD and the nucleocapsid um, were coupled at equimolar uh, concentrations, in this case, both 100 uh, picomoles per million beads, whereas the spike was somewhat lower at 10. We also included two control beads. Um, we have an IgG control, which is simply a different bead region that was coupled with total human IgG, and we use this to monitor the addition of anti-IgG detection reagents. And finally, our fifth bead is an instrument control bead, which is uh, internally dyed and is there to basically monitor the machine performance. So to um, bring this assay up and to develop it, we had to optimize a few different aspects. Um, once we had the antigen, we had to assess different antigen coupling concentrations. Uh, to confirm the coupling, we had to um, assess a few different antibodies from commercial sources um, to be sensitive enough to detect that. Um, once we had our, our bees coupled and the coupling confirmed, um, protocols are worked out. We had to then um, assess a good detection antibody, so we looked at several biotin-labeled or PE-directly conjugated anti-human IgGs. And then, of course, we also had to optimize the uh, serum dilutions we were going to use. In this case, we ended up picking 1 to 2,000, which equates to about 10 microliters of total serum input, so it, it's, um, you need very little serum for this assay. And then finally, once those things were optimized for the assay itself, we ended up deciding on a combination of biotin-labeled anti-human IgG along with SAPE, 
um, but we add them together in one step. So that uh, having the two separate reagents allows us um, to pretty to fine tune um, in order to minimize background and enhance sensitivity. Um, by adding them both together, we then make it a more efficient um, assay to run. And in a clinical laboratory, um, um, the speed of the assay and the efficiency is is obviously quite important. So this slide cartoons the general workflow of the assay. Uh, once the serum is aliquoted, the whole workflow is about 45 minutes. So this includes an incubation step where we incubate the bees along with the serum um, for 15 minutes at 37 degrees. Um, we wash it two times. Each wash is about two minutes. And then we incubate with our detection reagents together, as I said before, in one step. So that's another 15 minutes. Two more washes, and then we read it on the FlexMap 3D platform. Once the plate has gone through all that and is read, then um, before we even decide whether or not we will look at the patient samples, we assess all of the controls. So there are several controls integrated in each plate. Um, these include negative, uh, negative sample controls, um, including both PBS, um, TBN, so just buffer, as well as IgG stripped human serum. Um, there are also two positive sample controls we incorporate on every plate. This includes a low positive patient and a high positive patient. And then, as I said a couple of slides ago, we have our human IgG coded beads and our internal control beads. So for us to accept this plate and to, and to look at any of the patient samples, all of these controls have to be within range. Um, if any of them are out, then the plate is not, is not accepted. Um, we, we established the ranges by running many hundreds of samples through the validation procedure. Um, in order to, to get all of those quality control criteria um, uh, determined. So once all of that was established, then our next question was to decide how we were going to threshold and uh, differentiate negative from positive calls. In, for, when going into this assay, um, our biggest concern really was specificity, um, even more so than sensitivity. Um, so although we are in New York, we are actually in a region of somewhat low COVID-19 prevalence. Going into this, we estimated our prevalence was probably about 3% based on some seroprevalence work done by our public health laboratory and also our molecular diagnostics um, numbers. And so with a prevalence at 3%, um, a specificity really needs to be as close to 100% as possible in order to have a very high positive predictive value. Um, as mentioned here, so clearly 97% you're at the 3% prevalence, um, your, your PPV is quite low. So again, our goal was to get as close to 100% as, as possible. Um, to assess this, we used a set of pre-2020 um, serum. So we had this banked in our clinical laboratory, um, and it had been sent to us for a variety of um, diagnostic reasons. I'll go through that in the next slide. And then after running through these samples, we set our thresholds for S, R, B, D, and N separately that were all above any sample in that pre-COVID set. So that's what I'm showing on this slide here. So our, we chose our pre-COVID serum to um, address a number of different conditions which are known to have potential um, cross-reactivity in immunoassays. These include serum from patients with positive ANA titers, CMV, EBV, Lyme, rheumatoid factor, and syphilis, as well as um, serum from patients with a known acute respiratory infection from you know, other viruses, as well as many serum from patients um, whose serum was submitted to our laboratory and it was negative for anything that it had been tested for. Um, so by going through about 215 samples, um, this is the data we got. So I'm, in the columns on this slide, I'm showing you the average MFI um, across that group, and in parentheses, I'm showing you the maximum MFI because that is how we threshold based on the maximum. And what you can see is that, for the most part, a lot of the average background was below 200, but in a few instances, the maximum got quite a bit higher than that. This is specifically true on the nucleocapsids. So if you look at that column, um, you can see that in a few of the different groups, um, the maximum value started to approach 2,000. And it wasn't really a continuum, it's that most of the samples in that group were somewhat low, and then there were a handful that were, that were higher. Um, and so we thresholded in order to call all of those negative. 
once that was done, then we then we um, turned our attention to assessing positive values. So to do this, we had 125 serum samples from known SARS-CoV-2 PCR positive patients, which we batched um, by days from symptom onset. Um, and we did that by doing a chart review on, on all of them. And so our, our days from symptom onset uh, bins are shown in the first column. So we were looking at zero to five days, six to 10, 11 to 15, 16 to 20, and 21 plus. And the data I'm showing you in each of these columns is the percent positivity in that group. So for example, in the zero to five days from symptom onset category, in the Luminex assay, 44% um, were positive for spike, 28% were positive for RBD, 36% were positive for nucleocapsid, and our overall um, Luminex positivity was 48%. Um, and, and I'm sorry, I should have mentioned before that we considered an overall positive result, uh, one that was positive for any of those. So you just needed one out of three. We compared that to another EUA approved assay that we run in our lab, the Abbott Architect, which showed on the same set of samples a 32% positivity. Um, if we look at six to 10 days, um, we see the Luminex is showing 68% positivity, the Abbott was 54. And then by 11 days on, the two assays were actually quite equivalent, um, becoming essentially indistinguishable by 16 days, where they, they plateaued at around 92% of our SARS-CoV-2 PCR positive patients. So in conclusion for uh, my section, um, we found that the SARS-CoV-2 multiplex assay was highly sensitive and specific and compared quite favorably to the Abbott Architect CMA EUA method, um, which we think is also uh, extremely good. The results are highly reproducible between runs and users. Um, for our clinical lab, that's very important. Um, and we found that it really was sufficiently robust for clinical use. And I should point out that actually this assay was our first Luminex assay. We brought the technology in specifically for this assay. So um, we found that it was uh, compatible with the clinical environment. And uh, one of the things we really liked about it and one of the reasons we went to it is because we really wanted the ability to customize the antigens um, to allow for flexibility. As we all know, knowledge about the immune response to SARS-CoV-2 is evolving rapidly, and we wanted to be able to be fairly nimble to address that. Um, furthermore, the large dynamic range of the assay allows for us to develop quantitatively um, to assess, you know, for example, donors who have convalescent plasma, and to monitor recipients of both plasma and vaccines. Um, the assay I showed you today was um, validated as a qualitative assay, but we are um, intending to validate it further as a quantitative. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Steve and I'll be happy to accept any questions at the end. Thank you, Nicole. So, um... As we progress through this pandemic, uh, this type of assay uh, can still have use as we go into the post-pandemic phase. Uh, for one thing, as it spread globally, um, we started to see that the symptoms for uh, people with coronavirus resemble uh, flu as well as pneumonia-like infections. So as a result, it's possible that you know, there could be a small population that if they turn up positive or negative rather for say the PCR assay, they may have infections caused by other pathogens. So um, having a serological assay, you know, that can look for these other pathogens, which could be viruses, you know, or bacteria, uh, could be a benefit in the clinic. So this will allow us to also, you know, kind of monitor, um, you know, what is happening in the patient populations. Um, you know, how many of them are, are truly COVID-19 versus uh, being the result of other pathogens. And as we start to move into sort of the, this later phase of the pandemic, and as um, you know, second waves start to occur, again, having a multiplex assay that can look not just for uh, COVID-19, but also some of the other coronaviruses could be beneficial as um, things wind down or as we move into phases of uh, second rounds of infections. So uh, this approach, however, can also be used for other types of diseases which have similar clinical symptoms, but are the cause of different pathogens. For example, uh, hemorrhagic fevers, these can be caused by a variety of, of viruses and in some cases bacteria. In addition, some chronic syndromes can also be caused by a variety of different viruses, bacteria, or micro, uh, microbiological pathogens. So while the XMAP technology, uh, as we 
talked about earlier, can be used for a variety of applications, both proteomic and genomic. For this particular application of looking at serological uh, factors and immune responses to various pathogens, it, this can provide a, strong, a powerful tool for both the clinician and researchers to follow up how pathogens are, uh, different pathogens are affecting different populations, all the clinical ramifications, and the development of uh, good treatment strategies for these diseases. So with that, um, we'll start to take questions for uh, individuals who are interested in learning how to go from their singleplex assays, multiplex assays. So thank you for your time, and we'll take any additional questions now. And thank you, Dr. Angeloni and Dr. Pecora, for that informative presentation. And we will now start the Q&A portion of our webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. So let's get started. We have quite a few questions already coming in for our speakers. Dr. Angelini, Dr. Pecora, what antigens would you like to see in a multiplex serological assay? I can I can take a shot at that question. Um, generally, for for clinical use, I mean this really does differ by if you're running a clinical assay or a research assay. For a clinical assay, we want to see antigens that are both informative towards a particular disease, um, as well as those which might indicate cross reactivity with something close um, or something that's related. Um, so. For example, for the COVID assay, um, we used multiple antigens in order to threshold high enough on each of them to get high specificity and then have additional antigens to allow sensitivity. So the multiplex really gave us um, the best of both those worlds, um, whereas someone in a research or a vaccine um, background may want to add even more in order to get specific information for a defined epitope. Thank you for that. And our next question, if available off the shelf kit, would you use a Luminex multiplex serological assay? In the clinical laboratory, yes, um, we would be interested in using that. Yeah, Thank you. Our next research question. Labs. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say Go some ahead. research labs also uh, want them, uh, but a lot of research labs like to build their own. Thank you for that. Um, we have great questions coming in. And again, a thank you, audience, for, for submitting these great questions. Um, does Luminex have the COVID-19 antibody beads? Yeah, um, we don't make them specifically and sell them. Uh, that is uh, dependent on the researchers themselves, uh, you know, picking their own antigens and, and doing the coupling themselves, which is a pretty easy process. Um, we are working on a clinical bout kit, but um, as far as I know right now, we are not generating specific beads for purchase. Thank you for that. Our next question, is your lab a CLIA lab, and do you have to validate your assays as LDT? I can take that one. Our lab is a CLIA lab, so we are a full clinical diagnostic laboratory. Um, and yes, we did validate our assay as an LDT. Similar to the molecular assays, there is um, both the FDA and in certain states, there are state-specific regulations. In many cases, there are streamlined validation plans that are COVID specific um, in response to the public health emergency. And in New York State, we validated according to um, what was asked for um, by our state agencies. Thank you, Dr. Pecora. And here's the next question. Interesting. How likely are we to experience? Um, oops. I, I just lost it. I'm, I apologize. Uh, I believe the question was, how, how likely are we to experience another second wave, and um, how would that, I, I apologize, it just got deleted. 
Um, yeah, let me, no, let me give you a different one. I saw that question there. Yeah, no, go ahead. I question about how likely would it be um, to experience a second wave. I was trying to answer that one on uh, the answers there. I asked for verbal. Oh, okay. Um, but, okay, but, I see. Um, I guess, yeah, Nicole can take that from a clinical perspective, I think. So I think uh, as, uh, the short answer okay. is I, I I don't absolutely know, but I think everyone is expecting some measure of a second wave um, to occur. And that actually brings up a lot of interesting questions um, because it's still very much an area of active interest, what it means to have anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. Um, if they translate to immunity, if that is just in the short term, if that's in the long term, these are very important and active questions um, that no one really has answers to yet. So what that will mean in terms of the use of these assays ongoing is that it will, as we know more about that, it may be able to help assess whether there is immunity once that is established um, or whether or not it's durable. Um, as time goes by and we go into a second wave and maybe beyond, then there's going to be more of an interest also in IgG and IgM. Um, as we know more about the likelihood of reinfection, all those questions are going to be very pertinent. But right now, I feel like we're still at the very beginning, um, and we don't have answers for any of those questions um, yet, but they will all be active. Thank you, Dr. Kokora. And this quick next question is actually directed to you. And thank you again, audience members, for your great questions coming in. Um, TetraCore, as a Luminix partner, has FlexM array SARS-CoV-2, hopefully I said that correctly, human IgG antibody test that is notified at, um, to FDA. Will we be interested in comparing this test with your LDT? Um, I think we can have a conversation about that offline um, so I could find out more about it. Okay, perfect. Um, our next question, are there any resources provided COVID-19 antibodies making calibrate curves for a quantitative assay? Yeah, Nicole's trying to do that, so um, that might be a good one for her to handle. Yeah, so as I think as I, I ended my last slide by saying that, yes, um, it's currently validated as a qualitative assay, um, but we are in, in the process of developing as a quantitative assay. Um, it's not entirely straightforward because there's a lot of interest in actually translating that to a quote-unquote uh, classic titer number, which is a little bit uh, less clear than simply giving a quantitative result. But, yes, that's where we're going now. Thank you for that. And Dr. Angelini, Dr. Pakora, which Luminex commercial partners are currently developing COVID-19 serological multiplex assays? Yeah, I guess I can take that question. Um, so um, actually, TetraCore is one of them, um, and they've been asking a number of questions there about the presentation. Um, we also have uh, Luminex is also internally looking at uh, developing some assay, an assay as well. Uh, and we have um, some state labs that, are, in addition to uh, Nicole's, um, the Wadsworth Center has developed an assay, uh, one of the state labs in New York, um, which is not really commercial. That's being used, of course, in-state. Um, and Mount Sinai is also uh, developing an assay as well as a few other um, uh, academic institutions. Um, we also have a number of pharmaceutical companies that are using it for other applications to test um, either vaccines or biologicals that they're developing for the treatment of coronavirus. Um, and those are more uh, internal, so I really can't give you any details on those. Thank you, Dr. Angelini. This next question is for you, Dr. Pecora. Do you see the use and need for IDD um, cytotyping assay for your clinical needs? I don't. I don't know that that is going to be a clinical, a clinical assay. I can see it would be great interest for both research and for vaccine development, um, but at this point, I wouldn't see that for clinical. Thank you. And we have time for a couple more questions. Does Luminex have the COVID-19 antibody beads? 
Yeah, so again, the answer to that is no, at least not for sale. Um, we are building an internal assay kit um, that will be used for uh, clinical diagnosis. Um, that's still in the works. But if you want to, you know, generate an assay and you want beads with, um, you know, some COVID-19 antigen on it or another viral antigen, um, you know, we can assist you with uh, building that type of assay. And as I, you know, uh, outlined in the uh, presentation, the steps in doing that are pretty simple. Um, it can be done fairly rapidly. I mean, it took us uh, how long, Nicole, to develop your assay? Um, about three weeks and then a few weeks for testing, if you want to uh, summarize that there, Nicole. Yeah, I, I think that was about the timeline. Um, it, we, um, the commercial source that we use, GenScript, the proteins that we bought from them, um, fortunately were of high quality, and so we didn't have to um, try multiple suppliers. So since we had a good supply up front, it was really smooth. Thank you both. And what serological assay are you currently using and how does it meet or not meet your needs? So if that's um, for the clinical laboratory, we do use the Abbott Architect assay that I described in my presentation. Um, it's based on nucleocapsid like many uh, commercial assays are and it's quite good. Um, and the specificity is also extremely good, but because we are we want to get our specificity as close to 100% as possible, we use both assays together. Um, and also the the LDT Luminous assay allows us to address antigens other than N, so get us, like gets us into S and RBD. Thank you for that. And our final question for Kave. Is your interest in COVID-19 serological assay development focused more on clinical or research applications? Obviously, ours are um, very clinically oriented. We do work with a number of, we're an academic medical institution, so we do work with a number of research groups um, in our community. Um, but our primary goal of bringing this assay in was clinical diagnostics. Yeah, but then there is Thank the research both. side. Of course. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, on the research side, um, you know, there's also going to be researchers that uh, want to expand into maybe looking at uh, the titers in different populations, not just of COVID-19, but of other coronavirus variants, um, you know, to sort of do that immunosurveillance. Um, and in some situations, it might also be useful sort of on the research side, maybe a much more on the clinical side, about other respiratory pathogens. Uh, so like as we get into the fall, um, and especially if there's no vaccine available, um, you know, uh, maybe a serological method that can look at, you know, the titers to various uh, pathogens that are involved in flu versus pneumonia, um, you know, on, on the research side could be useful. Um, Nicole can comment on any usefulness of that on the clinical side, though, if she wants to. Thank you um, both for your presentation. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Absolutely, no, no, go that's ahead. Fine. No, I was, I was going to oh, say, I was it's actually just... it's difficult to say um, how to use that clinically ongoing, other than um, clinical in an epidemiological way, it's straightforward, but for a diagnostic way, it's, it's a little bit less straightforward. But um, go ahead. I was just going to thank you both for your presentation and clearly your important research that you both provided. Did you want to provide any um, final comments for our audience before we close? Just to thank everyone for attending and great questions. Uh, yep, same here. Uh, thanks for attending and uh, thanks for the good questions as well. Thank you, Dr. Angeloni and Dr. Pokora for your time today. And before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today as well and for their interesting questions. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Luminex, for sponsoring today's webinar. Questions we do not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand through the end of the year 2020. Lab Roots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, stay safe. Have a great day.
Bye-bye.